Hello Hunters, what is up? Welcome back. Today, I am doing a little solo. So uh, essentially what I'm going to dive into is if I was starting again in 2024 for bow hunting, this is the things that I would like to know. And this all came about because just recently my brother has picked up his first bow and essentially he hit me up and he goes, which episode should I listen to? <laughs> I'm like, well, start at one and go all the way through. It's just like 300 hours worth of content, right? <laughs> Um, and then let me realize, like, I really should just do a recap of some of the things that have mo been most useful for me coming into bow hunting. I mean, realistically, I've probably forgotten more than I've learned based on the different people I've interviewed and the conversations I've been fortunate enough to have since starting the podcast, uh, five and a bit years ago. Um, and if you've got the, the, I guess the ability to go back and listen to them all, then that's, that's like amazing. Yeah. Go and do that. You'll, t you'll pick up different tips and tricks from every single person, especially if you listen to it at different points of your journey. Um, there's episodes that I'll still go back to at the start of each rut. For instance, I always go and revisit the rut episodes that I've talked about. If there's a specific creature that I'm chasing, a critter that I'm after, I'll go back and listen to specific episodes based on uh, conversations that I've had before about those animals, because it does become really, really useful to just be like, okay, now I've hunted them a few times and I've got a little bit of a different perspective. Maybe I'll go back and re-listen to what they're saying and see if it makes me think any differently compared to when I have talked about it previously. Um, and I think that's just very helpful and very handy. And it is cool because the, the podcast kind of acts as like a bit of a guide in a sense with how much content we actually do have um, out and available for you guys. So definitely go back and listen to it. In particular, I'm going to talk about uh, certain episodes that you should go back and listen to. It's kind of like an, a relevant offswing of what we're talking about in tonight's episode or today's episode. Um, so to kick it off, essentially it all comes down to playing a bow and getting your gear. Uh, because if you don't have that stuff, then you can't necessarily go hunting. Now, not always the case. And sometimes it's um, you might be fortunate enough that you can come across a bow from someone else where they can get the bow for you um, and you can use their gear and have like a little bit of prep time leading up to a hunt and um, going out and hunting with them. But that's not always the case. And the big thing about bow hunting in particular, or bows in particular, the compound bows, is that um, you kind of have to tune a bow to you as an individual. And sometimes you might be lucky enough that your draw length is the same as a friend's draw length. But um, we're all built differently, which means that our arm um, reach is different, which means that our draw length is different. And so that's why you can't necessarily just pick up a bow. And I'm, I'm a reasonably tall dude, six one, and I've got a 30 inch draw. And a lot of people that I hunt with have like 28 inch draws. So it means that when I draw back their bows, my front arm is bent and pulling back to that back wall just doesn't feel comfortable because I'm not in a straight locked out position. So Realistically, you want to have your front arm locked out and being able to pull back into a comfortable position where you're not having to have your hand forward. You can pull it back and just sit into a comfortable position and that that back wall, we call it in in um archery or in bow hunting. And so um one of the biggest things is is like if you can get yourself to a shop. Um and if you can't get to a shop, then try to measure yourself up so you know at least what your draw length actually is. And there's a few different ways to go about that, but just Google um how to pick my or how to how to figure out my um draw length and it will give you a measurement to take across your front arm and, and chest and sometimes there's like a, a yeah, bit of a math equation you can do to it or you can just do the straight measure the whole way across but um once we've got your draw length it makes it a lot easier to either buy yourself a second hand bow or actually get into the shop they'll probably they'll most shops will be able to measure you up but if you get into a shop you're going to be able to actually feel the different bows and see what feels most comfortable in hand and so whilst you might think like, okay, um, this brand does a lot of really good marketing. I know them well. When you get into the shop, what you might actually find is that their bows don't feel comfortable in hand um, or vice versa. You might have your eyes set on a bow really, really, uh, I'd be really, really keen for it. And there was a guy I was talking to just recently that had this. He's like, I'm going to buy this bow. It's within my price range. It's awesome. He got to the shop and ended up spending um, an extra couple hundred dollars because he was like, it just felt so much better. The bow that I went and tested instead i ended up liking it better and so i got it um and it was funny because we were talking about the nut before we went and bought the bow he's like should i get this or this and i was like well there's a lot of people who use both of the bows and they're both obviously being a, a modern day bow like especially 2020 onwards like the the bows are incredible that they're coming out with the the technology that goes into these bows um and the yeah i guess the the mechanics of the bows are just they're so well designed and they it, there's not really much fault in them in a sense like they they all shoot incredibly well they shoot fast they um are designed to be quieter designed to have that speed and accuracy for an animal in particular so 
you can't really go wrong with some of the modern day bows. And so when it comes to it, that's when, it, when I say you should go into a shop because then you actually get to feel what feels best in hand. And that means um, that that bow is probably going to suit you best. However, with my brother's bow, um, we were going to buy secondhand from Word Go. So I didn't even send it into a shop. I'm just like, I'm going to look online for you and see what I can find. And there's a whole heap of different um, Facebook groups that you can be a part of. Um, you just ask to be a part of them. It's like Archery Buy, Swap, Sell, I think is the one that I mainly go to and see a lot of content on. And there's a lot of people who will sell bows from like the last year, last year's model because they've upgraded to this year's model and they will do that almost every year or or something similar. And I've talked to a few different people in bow hunting and a lot of them have the, the mentality of like, I'm going to sell my old bow knowing that I'm not going to get anything for it. Like I'm not going to make my money back on it and that's all right because it's going to be bringing someone else into bow hunting or giving someone else the opportunity to shoot a better bow. And I've just got like a little bit of my money back, like maybe a thousand bucks back compared to the the four thousand or whatever that I've spent. And I mean, realistically, I've always said it, buy once, cry once. But when I first got into bow hunting, I couldn't do that. I, I didn't have the the spare cash to be able to spend on an incredible bow from where go. Um and so it meant that I had to kind of dabble in it and I ended up spending twice. But it was the the sequences of events that I had to take before I could actually step into it properly. I couldn't justify um, I guess spending more than two thousand dollars on a bow to start with, um, and so I actually got, yeah, essentially two bows before I even got to my my first. Um, that's not the right way to say it. I bought a recurve bow, and then I realized I wanted to get onto the wheels if I was going to be um, successful, and so I went and bought a a good beginner pack essentially, and I used that bow for a long time, and then eventually I upgraded to the bow that I've still got now, which is my Elite Cure. So, um. Essentially, I bought yeah three bows before I got to the bow that I'm now continuously happy with. And it's only now, like four years down track, that I'm going, oh, I should probably look at buying a new bow. And it's like, I don't need to, but I just want to. <laughs> um, <laughs> so going back to my brother's bow, <clears throat> essentially with those, oh, I'm choking. Essentially with those secondhand bows, the concept is, is that you can get a really great bow uh, within like the last three to four years models sometimes even earlier, like even within the last year, let's say, and you can get them for way cheaper. So for Josh in particular, we bought him a bow, uh, secondhand Matthews V3X, a 29, um, so there's a 29 inch, oh, sorry, axle to axle. And um, we bought that for a thousand bucks. So that bow back in the day probably would have gone for, I don't know, 1800. I mean, even now, a brand new one would probably go for seventeen, eighteen hundred dollars $1,800, something like that as a bare bow. And so when I say bare bow, it doesn't have any of the extra um, accessories on it that you need to be able to shoot a bow that has uh, like a compound bow in particular. So if we're talking about a bare bow or sorry, a compound bow, compound bows will have a sight. So that's how you can obviously see what you're shooting. Um, you'll have your, I mean, on the back end of that, you've got your peep. And so many of them will you can get a peep to upgrade. But yeah, so sight and your peep is like your sighting system. You've got your arrows, obviously, is the second piece. You've got your rest, uh, which is the arrow rest. So where the arrow actually sits on to be able to make it level for when you shoot. Um, you've got your quiver, which holds the arrows in place. You've got your release aid, which is usually what you draw the draw the bow back with and shoot with. It's kind of like a trigger system, um, or we'll dive into them a little bit more in depth later. And then if you're going hunting, you've got your broadheads as well. Um, and then your whole arrow build out is, is another whole complex system, which we'll also kind of touch on in a sense today. Um, and then I'll point you in direction of other, other podcasts to go and listen to, to get more in depth, uh, insights to that. But essentially on your arrow, you're going to have your shaft, then you're going to have your inserts at the front. So depending on which system you're using, whether that's going to be like an, a half cert or, or what, there's, there's a whole heap of different complexities to that. And then you've got your knock on the end and, um, on the end that you click into your, your string, and then you've got your field point at the front or your broadhead. So field point is the the, um, the target archery style of practice heads. And then your broadhead is what you usually go hunting with the, the pointy parts that, that do all the damage. Um, and so when you're looking at that, as if you're buying a bear bow offline, you've still got another heap to invest. And realistically, when we bought Josh's bow, for instance, um, it cost us a thousand bucks and it had a really good rest on it straight away, an arrow rest straight away. So it had a QAD arrow rest, which is a great brand and well-known. Um, so we still had to get a sight. We still had to get a quiver. We had to get arrows made up for him. Um, and he actually already got given a release aid to practice with, at least for now. Um, and so he had to get arrows, had to get broadheads, and had to get the whole concept 
um, made up. So in regards to that, I jumped onto this archery buy swap cell and I got searching and then I, um, just sent messages to people that I knew online. I put up a thing on my Instagram page and just said, Hey, does anyone, um, have this available that they're looking to sell and essentially just got out, um, and had some had some people reach out and say, Hey, I've got this, I've got this. Um, do you want this? This is how much we're charging. And most people are willing to give it like uh, away for cheap. <laughs> and a, a lot of the time it's because they're sitting there and not actually, they're just collecting. Um, most of the time they're just collecting dust where they are. <laughs> and so it's like, it makes complete sense to actually, um, pass it on. I'm just looking for some stuff while I'm doing it. Actually, I'm just searching through. Um, it makes sense to pass it on because otherwise it's just going to sit in your garage and, and collect dust. Um, the cool thing was, is that we actually ended up having someone say, look, is it going to a good home? I said, it's my brother. So he's a wanker, but no, no I'm kidding. <laughs> I said, yes, it's going to a good home. Um, I can vouch for him. And, um, he's like, oh, he can have it. Like it just do me a favor. And when he's finished using it, pass it on again, make sure it goes to someone who's in need of it. And so. He got given a site and a quiver, which is incredible um, and saved Josh a lot of money straight away and kind of just lessens that barrier to entry, I guess, to get into it. Um, so yeah, we've got him set up. He's got um, the Matthews V3X. Like we said, we set him up with the jab sticks, um, new arrow company by Benny um, Fensum and Jack, um, which you guys should check out. And Jack Spinks, that is. And then um, the arrow rest, like I said, was a QAD rest. His strings that he had on it, I think, were the big fella bow strings. Really good, brand new strings uh, in the ghost color. Um, ghost color just means like they're not dyed as the strings. Um, the quiver we got given was the um, the specific Matthews brand. I can't remember what it is. Like the tight, the tight, not a tight spot, but it's like one that sits on incredibly close to the actual bow. Um, and then the release aid he's using is actually the. I want to say it's the knock-on version of the back tension that he has in the, the finger trigger. Um, and then the broadheads we've set him up with, of course, Cayugas. Um, and you guys can get a discount on that one too if you use the code BAB10. Um, but yeah, as a concept, I think you can you can really spend a lot of money on a, on a first bow, especially if you buy once, cry once. Like a brand new bow with all of the best gear, you can be looking at four grand for a completely new setup. Um Within saying that, you do not necessarily have to go out and spend four grand to get a good new setup. Like my bow still is not even worth anywhere near that. Um, it's probably worth half of that, to be honest. And it's done um, a, a lot of good for me. And I mean, as a concept, I've been doing this for five and a bit years and I've put down a lot of animals, nothing necessarily like huge and, and amazing, but they've been all amazing for me. And all the bows that I've used have done the complete work for me. And I guess as a concept in this podcast, hopefully we can kind of lay it out as to um, the things you need to do to make sure that you're hunt ready. And so, um, that's a bit of a, a background on bow hunt on grabbing your bow. Sorry. So either go to a shop, get yourself set up in a shop or try to buy secondhand. If you can, the thing is, if you're going to buy secondhand, you're going to have to get your bow sighted in. I mean, realistically, you're going to have to get your bow sight, um, tuned in is what I'm trying to say. You're going to have to get it tuned in or sighted in for you. So that means going back to like your draw length, going back to making sure the arrows are shooting straight. This is essentially where tuning comes into play um as a first concept i guess buying your bow i did the very first episode i ever did on um the podcast was actually with ian summers and he's the guy that i would recommend most people send their bow to um if they don't have the ability to go to a shop because he'll actually like yeah you can send it straight to his house he'll get it all set up for you um tuned up ready for you and send it straight back to you so it's firing absolute darts right um but ian summers buying the perfect bow was the very first podcast i ever did uh interviewing someone so that as a concept is well worth checking out. Um, oh, sorry, as a, as a an all encompassing uh, listen in a sense, um, we'll give you a little bit more insights as to as to yeah the depths you need to go to. So figuring out your draw length and your and your poundage. One of the biggest concepts is, is if you haven't been shooting much, uh, start low, drop your poundage right down, and get used to shooting. Get used to drawing back. Get used to going through the motions of shooting your bow. If you start too heavy, what's going to happen is you're going to overwork your muscles because you're going to get so excited about shooting your bow. You're going to want to shoot it more and more and more. And yes, you might build up the, um, the resilience around that and the resistance around it and make sure that your, like, your joints must, might adapt to it. But at the same time, I often hear of people that go too ham, too hard, too fast. And essentially what happens is they develop some form of shoulder injury and it takes them back 10 steps before they can move forward more. So 
drop your poundage down, get used to shooting a bow at 50, 60 pounds. And then as it feels more comfortable, or even 40 pounds, right? And as it gets more comfortable, keep jacking it up from there um, until you're at a weight that you're happy with for shooting uh, for your hunting. Now, within saying that, um, poundage does matter for shooting. Uh, and there is legal poundages that you need to be within uh, in different states, within Australia in particular. Um, I mean, wherever you're hunting in general, you should look up the rules with that because there will be rules and regulations that you need to follow to. Um, and by following to that and sticking to that code, obviously that is what starts to put hunters in not even a good light. That's just what you should be doing. As a responsibility of picking up a bow, that's um, part of the responsibility that you take on is the fact that you're then going to be representing bow hunters all around the world. And so you need to be doing a good job of that as well because it's a lifestyle and you'll you'll really figure it out it's a lifestyle that um it saves lives and i'm I'm really convinced of that it's really amazing what it can offer you but you also need to take on the responsibility of that otherwise you might get shut down and, and um attacked by a community that are very passionate about what they do <laughs> i mean that in the nicest way possible it's not like you yeah i've probably said that the wrong way i guess the biggest thing is just like do right by the thing that you're trying to get into and it will be it, it will do right by you as well um, so yeah, start at a lower weight, practice that and build your weight, build your weight up, um, as you're doing it in regards to arrow building, um, as a basic overview, I mean, realistically talk to the arrow company that you're going to buy from because they'll be able to give you direct and great guidance around, um, the spine arrows that you should be shooting, which is important, especially if you're using, um, uh, one of these compound bows where they are, they have a lot of energy in them. You're shooting a lot of energy through those arrows. There are some horror stories of if you're using the wrong spined arrows that it will, um, you could explode an arrow and then that's just horrible because if you get carbon through your hand, splinters through your hand, it's just not a nice thing, right? So when I'm talking about spine of the arrow, it's essentially like the flex or the stiffness of an arrow. So when we're looking, if your draw is under 30 inches and your bow is also 70 pounds or under, Typically, you're going to be around um, maybe a 300 spine arrow. Once again, check in with your arrow company you're buying from. They'll be able to give you more details. If your arrows, uh, sorry, if your yeah, if your arrows are 30 inch or your draw length is 30 inch and above, and you're sitting at 70 and or above in poundage, then you'd probably want to be looking at 250 spine arrows. Okay, and once again, I'm I'm not an arrow technician. I'm really not a, a technical guy when it comes to archery at all. And so get confirmation on everything you're buying. It's an easy way to make sure that you are only buying once. I definitely didn't understand the system when I first bought arrows and I actually bought the wrong set of arrows. I ended up selling them on the buy swap sell, that Facebook page that I'm talking about. Um, I was glad to see them go to another home, but I realized, and it was only after shooting them for a while that I was shooting definitely too light a spine, uh, spine arrow. So it could have, could have ended drast drastically bad, but it did not luckily. Um, Tune your bows. So most bows, you after 2020, a lot of the bows um, had models where you could do a certain amount of self-tuning on them, meaning that you could tune tune the bow, you could change the, um, the draw length on them, you can wind up and wind down your poundages. Um, you could do a lot to them without needing a bow press, but most of the bows to get incredibly accurate are going to need a bow press um sometimes when they come directly out of a factory straight to you brand new bows it might only take like a small a few small tweaks but the reality is a lot of them when you tune them up they do need the bow press to make it fully uh set up and ready for you especially if you're having to change like a, a lot of the things to it now once again i'm not i'm not like majorly technical with this and hence why i do just go to someone like ian summers or go into a shop and get them to tune it for you um, or for me, this is the way I've always gone about it. Um, I've gone to like Shane Chater before from Bohan's Domain. Um, I've gone to Ian Summers before. I've gone to um, Jake, what's Jake's last name? Gasprowski before. Uh, I've taken it into shops before and gone to them to get it tuned. So gone to many different people with, with my different bows over the different years to have my bows set up so they're shooting better. Which means that also when you change from your field points to your broadheads that they're shooting accurately as well. Because if you do not tune your bow and you shoot with broadheads on the front of your um, in front of your arrows, what you'll find is that your arrows do not shoot the same way. And so um, you'll go to, for instance, this is always why you should also 
test your arrows when you put in when you when you build out your your hunting arrow you should test them on targets before you go out hunting um because especially when you get to the location where you're going to go hunt you should go and test your shoot your arrows are shooting well because otherwise what happens is you go out and you you do all the effort to stalk in on an animal and you'll end up um doing a misfire shooting wrong um and it's not a not a nice way to find out that your your arrows off tune enough you've worked and done all the effort to get there um but yeah so tuning your bow what i would really recommend is if you're not going to go in and um figure it all out yourself and watch online courses or watch a lot of youtube content to figure out how to do it i mean there is some episodes that i did with um scott i can't remember the numbers i'll i'll put it in the show notes but um with scotty meadows we talked about how he goes through his self-tuning process and he does it all from home he does use a bow a, a bow press though so a bow press is essentially a way that takes the um pressure off of the limbs being like the top parts of the bow so it takes the pressure off the limbs so you can remove the the um cables or the the um strings and maneuver them and do the things that you need to do to make sure that the bow is in tune um there's a lot to it in regards to making sure that your cams which is like the big wheels on them the timing of them is in 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 time weirdly enough the timing of the cams is is in in alignment because otherwise if they're not that's when you'll see that your bow shoots weirdly for instance okay um there's a lot to it in regards to yeah how that works so that's where i'd really recommend like pay the money get your bow tuned by someone to make it just work properly and have it done from word go um you will need to know like your your draw length if you're going to send it to say someone like summers um, because they will need to set it up based on you and your size. So that's just something to think about. If you are sending it away, you're going to need to know your draw length. Um, but yeah, in regards to the bow tuning stuff, there is a lot online. You can definitely learn how to do it through YouTube channels, um, it, but you are probably going to need a bow press to make it happen, just so you, you completely understand that side of it. And that's why I just prefer to send it to someone. Release aids. Release aids are an interesting one. So this is, once again, essentially the way that you attach to the string to pull the, pull the um, string back with your arrow on it. Always make sure you've got an arrow on the string when you're drawing back, because if you shoot a bow, especially a compound bow, without an arrow on the string, what you'll find is that you will blow the string off of the arrow. Uh, sorry, blow the string off of the bow, and it does not end well. That's um, going to be a costly little mistake for you, okay? We break your bow, and you're going to have to get it all sorted out before you can use the bow again. So always make sure you've got an arrow on it. Now, release aid is the thing that we pull back with. There's all different variations of release aids. There's trigger release aids, so whether that be a pointer finger or a thumb trigger. There's back tension, which means that as you pull back, it eventually releases based on the poundage that's being sent through that release aid. And then there's a hinge, which is where you essentially same sort of concept. You pull, 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 and eventually it gets to a point where the the mechanism releases and it just fires off. Now, back tension and the hinge release the concept of these is that it automates a surprise release, which is a, a great way to get into hunting or bow hunting in particular, because what happens with the trigger is if you punch the trigger, which means like pulling on the trigger really fast or thinking at that point in time, this is when I need to shoot. So you press the trigger or you punch it with your, with your finger or your thumb, depending on which trigger variation you're using. What happens is that that makes more erratic shots and um, the movements that will happen with that typically are going to be... Um, quite drastic and and you'll not have a repeatable process okay so where a back tension or a hinge comes into action is that it it is like a surprise release so you're constantly aiming and what you'll find is when you aim your pin will move all over the spot so the pin being what's inside of the site that we're aiming with and so you'll have your pin on your target and it will just move it will float it will do figure eights it'll go up and down and all over the place and it'll come back into space with the um with the target of where you want to shoot and then it will move off. Okay. So you, not necessarily something you can greatly control. And so what you can do instead is instead of just punching the trigger when you're like, okay, we feel a drive by and we're on target, bang, trying to pull it, that's a really bad habit to get into and not a great way for uh a, like I said, a repeatable, consistent shot. And so the back tension ones do work really well. The other variation of this is, excuse me, using a trigger like a back tension release and so um this is what i try to do i will get pull back into position i'll hook my finger over the top of the bow or over the top of the trigger and i'll either go for a slow pull um meaning i'm pulling back through my elbow so making the whole 
um, whole arm move. And what happens is eventually, because I'm locked in place, my trigger's here, what will happen is eventually it snaps and takes my shot off. Okay. Same thing can be done for a thumb release. You're pulling back, 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 and eventually you're going to pull enough tension that up against the thumb and it boom, shoots off. Okay. Um, really, there's a lot of videos. Shot IQ, um, Joel, I am interviewing soon, so you'll be able to jump on and have a look at his stuff, Joel Turner. But you can go do the Shot IQ course. Um, also, Brad Murphy, um, the Building Better Bow Hunters course is available uh, where he goes through the A to, a to Z of bow hunting stuff. Um, Shot IQ is all about like accuracy and shooting. Um, there's a whole heap of different variations of these people who have put their stuff up online that is very, very powerful um, for learning how to do it properly. And the big thing is, if you learn how to do it properly from where go, you're going to have a much better experience with um, with hunting, with bow hunting, with archery in general. And you're going to want to keep coming back. It's going to be more enjoyable. You're not going to have to undo bad habits. Um, and typically when it comes to undoing a bad habit, you have to take 10 steps back before you can take two forward. And then it's a slow progression from there. So Try to do it right from where go and you won't have necessarily those problems. Um, so targets, buying yourself a target is well worth it because you're going to want to practice at home. Uh, now, whether you're going to go and get yourself a foam target from a shop or whether you're going to make yourself one, uh, the very first target I had, and I used these for years on end. Um, I mean, it wasn't actually that long. I did buy my first Reinhardt target not not too long after for shooting broadheads in, to, in particular because I didn't want to have to sharpen them like crazy every single time I shot them through my old system. So the old system, and there's a video on YouTube, um, on my YouTube channel, and it was literally just going to Kmart into the back or Bunnings in the back in the bins, and they've got all of their um, packing plastic, stuffing as much packing plastic as you can into a cardboard box, and then taping the absolute crap out of it, just taping it up so it all stays in there. And that um, that density, if it's really compressed in there, that will stop your arrows. However, it's not as secure maybe as just getting yourself a target um the other variation of this is like the floor matting the the rubber floor matting uh like the foam floor matting that you'd use for camping let's say uh that you can get from bunnings from kmart from target stuff like that um that stuff can work really well if you get a heap of that and just compress it so you can either compress it by duct taping it all up or i've seen people do it where they'll get two bits of wood um on each end and essentially bolt it down so drill all the way through bolt it down so you've got the bolts on the outside so drilling sorry drilling through the wood having your big long rods on the outside of the foam and just tightening it all the way down bolting it all the way down so it just compresses it so you're shooting into those that foam that can also work really well um good target i mean really you're probably looking two three hundred dollars or thereabouts if you're going to get like a big one that's going to last you a long time and then of course there's all like your your 3D targets. Um, and they're really great for the concept of learning where to shoot on an animal and doing it consistently because there's a difference between shooting a target that's a dot and shooting a target that looks like an animal and knowing exactly where you're going to hit it every single time. So as a concept or best practice, buying a 3D animal is definitely one of the better things you can do for um once again, making it as repeatable of a process as possible and going through the same concept time and time and time again in practice and it will translate a lot to when you're then shooting uh, a real life animal compared to if you're just shooting a block for instance and don't get me wrong this is still a very powerful method is just shooting and practicing and getting used to it but um when you've got a live animal then in front of you no matter what you've been shooting as a target you're still going to get adrenaline dumping into your body and it's going to be uh, uh you're going for a ride let's just say it that way um so yeah, buying and setting up yourself a target is is a, it's a given. You have to have it, right? So you can actually practice. And then that comes down to practicing. We really need to practice, okay? Practice, 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 practice. Um, what we want to really design is a repeatable process. And so when I go through my process, um, what I do is I set up my feet stance. I've got an open stance slightly. So what that means is that my front foot is my left foot. My back foot is my right foot. My right foot is slightly further forward than what my left foot is and then my left foot slightly turned towards the target okay so i'm essentially just opening up my hips and then pointing my hip bone uh on the left hand side so my left foot being further forward that's the the position that i'm then the hip that i'm then drawing or pointing towards the target that i'm aiming at okay uh i'll go through and load my arrow once my feet stance is right i'll hold the bow directly at the target so whatever i'm aiming for the bow will be pointed at it and I'm trying to draw straight back. So not trying to do a big over it's like a sky draw or anything like that, pointing directly at the arrow and sorry, directly at the target where I'm trying to aim. 
I've got it in position. I'm pulling back and I'm finding my anchor now. Um, so as I draw, I draw back, find my anchor position, depending on which release I'm shooting. If I'm shooting my back tension, I'll have my fingers, my pointer and my root finger tracing my thumb. If I'm shooting my trigger, I'm aiming for the main knuckle of my pointer finger to be in hard against my cheek. And then I'm wrapping my finger around the, the trigger once I get into position. Okay. <clears throat> once I'm in this position, I'm finding the bubble and making sure that it's level. So the sights will typically have a level in them. And I'll just make sure that my bubble is in alignment. So moving my bow, bow and adjusting it however I have to, to make sure that it's in alignment first. And then I will line up um, the peep completely around the site. So typically the way that the peep and sight system works is that you've got a small circle back here and you've got a big circle up here. Um, the big circle being your sight and the small circle being your peep. And we're trying to line up so that they look like that, like your outer rings are joining together. And that's how we know like we're all in alignment. And from there, I'll just double check my level. And then I'm here I go, pull, 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 pull. And saying that as a process, pull, 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 pull. Sometimes I'll go through and say, aim small, miss small. So picking a really small space where I'm, wherever I'm shooting and aiming for like just a dot inside of the dot, for instance, or if I'm aiming on an animal, I'm looking, and I'll, we'll go through that actually in depth in a second. But yeah, just pull, 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 talking to myself as I go through, knowing that I'm going to take a good shot. And that as a whole process is like a repeatable process for me. So it's something that I go through and do over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. Okay. So hence why I could just ex explain it to you because it's something that I have done so many times. It means that even if I put my bow down for months on end, when I then come back to it and I start shooting again, it's just a repeatable process that I can step straight back into and start shooting really well again. <clears throat> okay. So uh, one thing that's actually really worthwhile is there's, there's many different variations of this. So there's, um, you can film it. So filming yourself and watching for things that just don't look right, especially if you've watched a lot of archery or watched a lot of videos of other people shooting in bow hunting in particular. So filming yourself and seeing, um, do I draw the same? Do I look like I'm in a comfortable position? Am I standing upright or it, it, are my hips slightly tilted forward? Are my shoulders elevated? Like, is there something looking funky and out of place when I'm shooting? Um, and if so, then fix it, right? That, that's one way to do it. So going through and fixing it by yourself and aiming for like a perfect practice where possible. But within saying that, it's not necessarily always doable. And so um, there are systems online, like um, his name's just evaded me. There's a bow hunting coach, and I think it's called fixmyarchery.com or fix my, yeah, I think it's fix my archery, something along those lines. Um, but if you, if you look that up, you'll be able to find him. He's a bow hunting coach. Um, I can't believe it blanking on his name. Anyway, um, he'll do a live video analysis with you. So you jump on a Zoom call and he'll go through the complete shot process with you, build it out with you. So you know you've got a repeatable process. He's over in America and he'll be able to yeah take you through that. So I think a repeatable process is one of the best ways that you can um the one of the best ways that you can get accurate and fast. Uh sorry, accurate fast because you know then what's gone wrong. If everything, if the bow is completely in tune, it's only the person who's holding it that's going to make it misfire. And so then when you've got a repeatable process, what we're able to see then is what's going wrong in the process. You're like, oh, that shot to the right. What was I doing wrong? Maybe I was gripping it a little bit tight. Okay. I mean, that's something that I didn't actually talk about was my grip on the, on the bow. And so um, maybe just to touch back on that. Position-wise, what I'm doing, is uh so we've got the the handle there i'm essentially putting my thumb kind of either either way and then wrapping my hand around trying to get my pointer finger and my thumb touching uh and then the other three fingers are going just very relaxed okay and in this position once i'm at full draw i'm also just trying to relax as much as possible i'm not trying to squeeze the bow not trying to choke it not trying to white knuckle it um, because that's all the things that can tend to go wrong. So really trying to relax once I'm pulled back and trying to keep the tension in between my back um, and holding that position. Then as I do the pull, 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 I'm just trying to keep my shoulder blades squeezed together to make sure that um, I'm in a, a back position where I'm comfortable rather than it pulling me forward and being in an uncomfortable position where you're constantly having to fight. <clears throat> all right, moving on. Hunting kit. This is important. Um, what you take out in the field does matter. And you can get away without a lot of the stuff, but at the same time, eventually you're going to want to do it. Um, you're probably going to want to have it, especially if you want to set yourself up for 
best case scenarios and best success when you're out hunting. So my hunting kit, or let's just go over the things you need. So hunting kit, camouflage shirt and a face um, cover of some sort at a bare minimum, right? You're going to want to have like something that you can cover your face with. A lot of people just use the buffs. So it's like a big bit of material, looks like a, a tube of material where you can pull it up kind of over your nose. Uh, and if you're wearing a hat, essentially all it's showing is just your eyes. So you've got that and a camouflage shirt on, maybe just some work pants or green pants of some sort, um, green or beige, like blend into the, the natural elements. But ideally, if you can walk out for good camo from where go, this is like a buy once, cry once situation. Once again, like buy your camo, oh, sorry, buy your, your shirt and pants that are matching. If you can, um, buy buy a hat and the face cards and everything that are all the exact same if you can um actually um brackenware do have a discount through me so you can use that as bab 15 that will get you 15 dollars off of brackenware if that's something you want to check out um and so with that essentially they have a full kit where you can get jacket pants gloves everything i've got the full kit of theirs and it's good stuff um but yeah, so going back to it, so yeah, camouflage shirt and a face guard at minimum because the other thing you can do if you don't want to have a face guard is wear face paint or something like that. Or essentially, what we're trying to do is if you can think about if you see a face in the wild, you're going to understand it's a face, right? And deer are similar. Um, versus if you just see eyes, like if your face is broken up, broken up, and you'll see a lot of Americans do it with just like face paint um, of some sort, like army face paint, where it just looks like their face is sticks and it's just breaking up the shape of their face. It at least pulls away the attention from it being like, that's a round face that's looking right at me right now. Um, and so that's all we're trying to do. So pants, shirt, hat of some sort, um, jacket and gloves for the colder seasons, and then hiking boots of some sort. Now, I've always been a big fan of volleys because I really, I don't wear shoes very often. Uh, I work from home. My office, I, we're in my office right now. And essentially... I'm always barefoot apart from when I go to the gym in the morning. So for me, wearing shoes is not necessarily comfortable. Wearing shoes with a lot of um, support in them, it actually makes my knee sore. It makes my shin sore. Uh, it makes for worse wear afterwards. So I've always been very into flat, flat sole shoes for the last kind of 10, 15 years or so. Um, within saying that though, what you need to do is figure out what works best for you. I now have a pair of hiking boots. I've got some Solomons and um, I wear them a lot i do still jump in between both of them though i'll chop and change between depending on what country i'm in um and what i'm having to hike as to which shoes i'll go in <clears throat> and also what i'll often do is start my hunt in my solomons and if they get too sore if my feet get too sore or my knees or anything get too sore then i'll switch back to what i know which is the volleys and keep going that way the biggest thing we're looking for in, in a hiking boot is figuring out um ankle support and then obviously when you're stepping on the, the big, the big aha moment for me was when I stood on a sharp tree root and it went straight through my boot. Um, it went straight through my, through my volley and into my toes and I sliced my toe open and I was just lucky that it, it wasn't worse than what it was. But then within saying that, I've also done the exact same thing with my <clears throat> Solomons with the thick base on them. I actually put something straight through the base of my, of my um, foot, no, sorry, through the base of the shoe. It was just lucky enough that I actually realized what was happening and was able to stop it once I felt like the small prick. And so I uh, luckily didn't get anything through my foot at that point in time. Um, you, you could definitely, I guess, argue that the Solomons did a better job of protecting the foot in that, that case. And so it's just about once again, protection for your feet, making sure that you're in a comfortable position that you are going to be able to walk and walk for hours on end. Um, I took my brother-in-law out hunting for his first week of hunting and he wore his steel cap boots that he wears to work every single day. And within the first day, they had absolutely buried him. His feet were ripped to shreds and he was not in a, a great place with his feet. We had to wrap them up and stuff. And um, he managed it like he did well throughout the week. But the concept was there just because they're comfortable for you throughout the day, a, a steel cap boot is not recommended for up in the hills. Um, they're not going to be as supportive as what you think. So get yourself a proper hiking boot if you can um, of some sort and make sure it's suited to you as much as possible. Wear them in before you go in for your first hunt meaning um, wear them around the house, wear them to work, go for a few big walks in them just to make sure that you kind of soften them and um, position them into your foot because otherwise um, you'll end up with very sore legs on the very first day of your hunt where you're trying to break these boots in essentially. Okay, 
So that's kind of your, your kit in regards to what you're going to be wearing. Um, other things to think about, you're going to need binoculars and a range finder. Range finder is going to be the thing, it's like a laser where you essentially can see how far away distances are. Now, typically with your site, you're either going to have either a one pin site, a three pin site, or a five pin site. It's just the way they tend to be made. There are different variations, but that's like the bare basis of them. And sometimes if you're on a one pin slide, for, in for instance, you're going to have a slideable site, which means you can set the distance. Now, if you don't know what the distance is, how can you set the distance? And that's where a range finder comes in handy. A lot of the stuff that we do within bow hunting, like ideally we're shooting under 30 meters, under 20 meters if possible. Um, but you don't know, once again, those distances. And sometimes if you're shooting across dead ground, which is like, for instance, if there's a creek in between me and the, and the animal, it can look further or it can look closer. And so having that, that range finder essentially just gives you like a hundred percent guarantee. This animal is at 22 meters right now, set my sight and shoot the bow. Okay. Or if you've already got your set pins, it's at 22 meters. I know I can use my 20 pin. I might have to aim a little bit high if needed because of the two minute, two meter difference. Um, and let's go for it. That's actually something I should talk to in regards to practice. When it comes to practice, practice in all different positions, practice different distances, practice really, really close, uh, practice the, the splitting of the difference. So if you're using multiple pins and you've got it set at 20, 30, 40, for instance, split the difference. So don't just shoot at 20, 30, 40 every time, shoot at 25, shoot at 26, shoot at 34. These different distances so you can understand what happens with your arrow when you're on, when you're using your 30 pin, but you're actually setting at 34 meters is there much of a change in the position of where your arrow is landing? So you can understand those things. And when you've done it enough and practice it enough, um, you'll then know that you have to do certain things at certain distances. So a really good example of this is I had a fox run literally to my feet, so a meter and a half distance from me. And what I did was use my top pin, being my 20 meter pin. And what I didn't realize is because of how close the, the fox actually was, and where your sight is versus where your arrow rest is, what I should have been doing was using like the bottom pin. So my 40 meter pin would have actually hit the fox. I was using my 20 meter pin. I shot underneath the fox because of how close it actually was and that the trajectory never got up the 20 meter pin, if that makes sense. So it will make more sense when you practice the shot, that's for sure. But that was a really tough learning lesson where I essentially watched this fox run straight away despite him being so ridiculously close to me. Um, and so as a concept, yeah, just understanding all the different distances that you'll be shooting with your bow and practicing then kneeling, practicing standing up, practicing sitting down, practicing, um, yeah, funky positions essentially because that's the sort of stuff that's going to happen when you're out in the bush. I have a quick drink. So binoculars are really handy because when we go out, um, what you'll find is that a lot of the time you'll actually, you'll spend so much time glassing and looking at things, glassing, meaning using your binoculars to search around and see what's about. And um, you're going to look at a log or a rock and be like, that's a pig or that's a deer. And then you look at it and you're like, oh no, it's just a, it's just a rock or it's just a log. I'm glad I have my binos to be able to check that whole distance rather than trying to do a complete random stalk on this, this rock, <laughs> for instance. Um, so binoculars, excuse me, binoculars are really, really helpful. Um, they're actually probably the tool that I use the most when I'm out bow hunting is my binoculars. They're always, they, they sit on my chest. I've got a bino harness that has my binoculars here and my range finder right here. And essentially I'll walk, I'll stop, I'll glass, I'll walk, I'll stop, I'll glass. I'll see something over here, I'll glass. Okay. So I'm checking out everything. Even when I see an animal, I'm looking at it through the binoculars to make sure um, like just to observe the animal more, just to find out more about the animals and watching them from afar is really cool. And you start to learn a lot about them, but also, um, you can be the difference between seeing like, okay, is it a, a spiker deer meaning like a first year male deer, or is it, uh, is it a, a doe or a hind? Uh, so a female deer that I can, I can shoot. And if you're not going to shoot the, the young boys in particular, then you're like, okay, well, that's a deer that I can't hunt because it's a spiker. I'm going to leave it be where it is and I'll keep looking for the other deer. Um, as an example, right? So binoculars and rangefinder, and then some form of bino harness. The other thing that gets used a lot by bow hunters, especially um, whilst you're getting used to wind, is a wind checker. And so usually this is just like a little, um, a little puffer of some sort. Like essentially, it's a little plastic bottle with a little spout on it, where you can give it a little squirt, 
and it will puff chalk or powder of some sort, corn, flour, depending on what you want to use. People use ash, like burn, uh, like the coal or ash from a fire. Um, have that really broken up in the fine like soot stuff. Spray that out because that's something that animals are used to smelling compared to like a, a talcum powder where an animal will freak out when it smells that. If it walks across that, it will stop and it, you'll see it be stunned by there's something here. I don't know what the heck it is, but it's not natural to me. Um, so paying attention to things like that does also matter. But yeah, a wind checker in general has a concept. The winds do change a lot. And so yes, you might have an easterly, for instance, which is constantly blowing in your face. But what you'll find is like when it dies down and it picks up, and it dies down and does that stuff, it can swirl and it can spin and it can go in different directions and stuff. So in particular, if you're trying to get really close to an animal, um, the other thing is like, as you jump into different terrains, as you go into a creek, for instance, if you're staying on the edges, typically your wind is going to pull down into the creek at different times of the day um, when you've got your thermals happening. So as the sun comes onto you, your smell is going to raise up the mountain versus in the afternoon as it starts to drop and the sun comes off of you your smell will drop down the mountain so there's different things that will happen at different times of the day and that's why it's really helpful to have this little puffer <laughs> as you get around because it gives you a chance to check the wind and see what's happening especially when you're on a stalk give it a quick puff and you're like oh hold up it's doing things i don't want it to be doing right now uh i'll go this way instead now ideally you get to a stage where you're feeling the wind as you're walking and you're like yep cool it's on the it's on the front of my face we're good we're in a good position here. And as you get closer, then you might check it a few times. Some people really rely on their wind, check wind checkers a lot, um, but you don't necessarily always have to once you learn the wind a little bit. The biggest thing is that it's, it's, um, it's not a repeatable process. <laughs> the wind will change drastically on you and um, you'll, you'll see it blow a lot of stalks for you if you don't pay enough attention to it. I mean, even if you do pay enough attention to it, you're still going to blow some stalks on the wind, especially when it's swirling. Um, Okay, in regards to a backpack, I actually used just like a Reebok bag for many years. It was like a, a tactical bag, like it was good, but it wasn't necessarily like an amazing hiking pack or something like that. So if you're going out and buying your very first pack, preferably we want to have something with a waistband on it where it's going to take a lot of the load around the waist rather than it all being on your shoulders, especially if you're packing out an animal. What you'll find is if that weight is on your shoulders, you will burn your shoulders out very quickly from carrying a heavy pack. Okay, so if you've got something that can have um, a waistband clip and or a frame on the back of it just to help with that loading. That's going to help out a lot. Inside of your pack, you're probably going to want to have a first aid kit of some degree. Um, I don't have it written down as to which number it was. It was in the 130s, um, but did an episode all about um, wilderness first aid. So I will chuck that into the, the show notes as well because that's important to understand. Inside of the pack, you'll also want a knife and some form of sharpener, be that a steel or a knife sharpener and or a broadhead sharpener. Um, I've got a little game. What is it called? A workshop. Is It's a little field tactical sharpener. Essentially, it's got um, different grits on the, like a sanding stone, essentially. It's got uh, a leather strop and it's got also um, kind of what acts as like a steel as a, ceramic rod that you can use to help sharpen your knives up um, or sharpen your your broadheads up with so some form of sharpener and or steel um, and a knife obviously a sharp knife is ideal so a knife that you're going to be using for cutting up an animal um, a camelback or water bottle and then some form of game bags ideally for taking your meat out if you're going meat hunting in particular um Just trying to think if there's anything else in regards to the hunting kit. I think that's about it. Obviously, there'll be little other things that you might want to take with you, the little niceties that you might take. For instance, I'll often take a dog and gun coffee out with um with my jet boil and have a coffee on the side of the mountain as well. Um, so it's about figuring out what 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 you want, and you'll you'll develop these things. Some toilet paper. Um, I met some people that need to poo every time you go for a walk, <laughs> versus others that don't at all. So um, yeah. Plastic bags and or um, and or gloves, maybe some some people are a bit, um, I guess, just ultra protective of if you've got a cut or something like that, and you're trying to butcher meat, then you should definitely probably have some form of gloves to make sure that you're not contaminating either yourself or the meat. Um, but yeah, there's there's different things that you can have that are niceties, but I guess that's like a bare basic kit 
as regards to the things you'd want. So backpack, first aid kit, knife, camelback or water, game bags, um, sharpener or steel. I mean, the other thing I didn't put in there is um, either like a personal location beaker and or a walkie-talkie of some sort so you can get in contact with people if you need to. Um, gaining access or paying to hunt. Essentially, this is one of the biggest things that bow hunters in particular have troubles with is gaining access. Um, I think hunters in general, especially here in Australia, I mean, different countries might be different, um, especially if you've got a lot of public land access. There is a lot of public land access here in Australia. You do need to go and do your R license if you want to have that. Um, and then you can hunt in uh, Victoria or uh, New South Wales have a lot of public land access. Um, and then the other country, sorry, the other states, I believe you have to get public land access for all of them. I think, I don't think Northern Territory has any public land access. So you have to get, sorry, for all the other states, you have to get private land access. I don't know if I said that right before or not. So this is where a pay block might come into place um, because there's, there's blocks that already have it set up where they can have hunters go there. You can pay to be there, um, which means you're paying to play. Essentially, all it means is that um, you've got a pre preset place where you know there's been animals um, hunted there before. The only concept with this is that because animals have been hunted there before, it is going to be harder hunting, meaning that they're going to be uh, more skittish than other places. Now, within saying that, depends on how the block is managed. If they're hunted only on weekends or only once a month, um, it's going to be very different to a block that's hunted every single day. And then um, depending on the type of species that are on the block, that's also going to dictate how um, skittish they might be. Like a deer in general is much more skittish than a goat. And then if you um, add then hunting to those animals every single day, they're going to be even more skittish once again. So it's just about figuring out, okay, is that the route you're going to go? And if so, finding the blocks that uh, are close and within distance to you that you can actually go to. The other variation is, uh, so I think I said inland hunting properties for that. The other variation is... Um, Ridge group is a good one that's in particular the the um the Brisbane Valley region. So you can pay membership to Clark and the Ridge Group and um you get to go out and use their system where they manage deer species on different um different blocks that they've got access to. And essentially it's like a a pest management series or system that Clark has set up and really, really interesting um as to how that works. So that's definitely well worth looking into. They do do rut hunts as well each year. So you can you can pay to be a part of the Ridge Group and then pay to go on the rut hunts if that's something you're interested in. Um, obviously, you've got all of your different guides and stuff all around Australia. There's different blocks throughout the, the country where they've got um, some of the best animals on offer where you can go and pay to get a fast track hunt happening, essentially, where they'll take you out. They'll show you where the animals are. They'll showcase exactly how to get in close to them. Um, if you can, obviously, try to get in with a bow hunter compared to a rifle hunter, unless you're trying to do it by yourself. In which case, obviously, if you go for a rifle hunting background, it doesn't, uh, sorry, rifle hunting block, it won't matter because you're going to be the one that's doing the stalking anyway. Um, but yeah, I, I essentially what I'm getting out there is that bow hunting and rifle hunting, they're same, same, but very different. And so as a concept, if you've got someone, if you're a beginner and you're going out with a rifle hunter, they're going to do a lot of things differently to, um, to how you're going to want to do them in regards to getting incredibly close. Some rifle hunters is not necessarily the case. They will want to get incredibly close and they'll they'll have a very uh, similar mindset to bow hunters. But typically what I've found is that um, the the bow hunt starts where the rifle hunt finishes. And so you do have to get so much closer. You do have to have that extra skills and build up. Um, it's not even extra. It is it's extra skills in the sense of stalking and getting close and being having that patience to get as close as possible without the deer or the animals actually um, actually knowing where you are. Or knowing that you're there. Um, there's a whole bit of different like systems and associations within Australia. I don't necessarily know if they all offer hunting, but being a part of them, you're probably more likely to be surrounded by more hunters and then potentially have the ability to go and hunt more. So like the, the Australian Deer Association, going to your local bow hunting club and joining up and seeing if there's any other hunters there. Um, talking in different um, Facebook communities and stuff. Like there's, there's many ways that you can connect with different people. But I did a whole episode on this. It was uh, episode 115 on gaining access, gaining hunting access, and just some of the thoughts and, and processes that I've used and other people have used. And since releasing that uh, at the start of this year, 2024, I've had multiple people reach out saying like, thank you so much. That helped me to get my first block or to get my second or third or fourth block. And um, as a process, it definitely works. So it's just about going and listening to that episode. I'm not going to repeat the whole thing. <laughs> um 
going on the hunt. So obviously you want to pack your bag, you want to pack your bino harness, get your camo sorted, make sure your bow is ready. You've got your release aid, your arrows, um, that they're all set up and all shooting accurately. So make sure you've shot all of your arrows before you've gone. Make sure you've shot them with your broadheads on and you're practicing with the broadheads before you go out for your hunt. And then when you get to the location, also practice with the bow because in transit, sometimes things can get knocked around and bumped and stuff. We want to make sure that everything's as accurate as possible um, when we're going out for a hunt. When you get to the block, uh, if you've got the access through a landowner, then asking them for their insights, figuring out from their experience where any of the animals are. Um, So where have they seen them? Where do they hang out? Where do you see them the most? When was the last time you saw them there? All those basic questions that you might not think of is just essentially like, um, I guess, A, getting, once you're out of property, figuring out where your, where your boundaries are and then figuring out what they call their different uh, paddocks, for instance, or where they call their different areas of the block. And then understanding where are you seeing the critters the most. Once you've got all of this information, um, it kind of depends on time of year, but one of the biggest things you need to make make do and make right of every single time is the wind. If the wind is in the back of your neck and you're walking towards something, you've blown out that whole area. And critters, all animals are very, um, they use their senses a lot. And wind is the one of the biggest, or smell is one of the biggest senses that they will rely on. Okay. So they will look at you and see something move or think that they see something move, but you're, you're a camouflage tree essentially. And they're like, hmm. Was that tree there before or not? I'm not sure. I think I just saw it move. So I'm just going to stare at it for a while. And if you can stay still enough and do not move, eventually that animal is going to go back and go like, "Mm, I think I'm safe. Maybe. I'll just pretend to eat right now. And then it might look up again and then it will go again. But the big concept I'm getting at is as long as that wind isn't blowing towards that animal, it will give you a second chance in some cases. Sometimes it will give you a third and fourth and fifth, uh, depending on the animal. As a concept, though, if the wind changes and it blows onto that animal, they're gone. They will not stick around. They will be running as far away as possible. So making sure that the wind is in in your face or going to be based on, okay, the, the farmer says that this is the perfect place to go and look for them. Uh, it's where I see them all the time. It's the only place I ever see them. I'm going to go to that part of the block. But if you set up on this side and as soon as you hop out of the car, you're blowing your wind across that location, you're probably not going to see any animals. So making sure that you set your wind up um, from where go. It is really the the it should be the first part of your plan every single time is what I'm trying to get at. Um, and you want the wind to either be going across your body or in your face. Obviously, if you're walking to a location, sometimes you have to do loops around uh, to get into a better location. You have to come up on top of a hill, down the bottom of a hill, and walk around and do the things you have to to make sure you're not going to win those animals. Glass over everything and glass it often. So I talked about before seeing rocks and thinking it's a pig. Um, or seeing a, a log and thing is a deer, glass it anyway, because you never know. Sometimes you will see it and be like, hmm, a very funny story, actually. Me and a friend were hopping over a fence one time and we had the sun shining in our eyes and we we're looking. I'm like, that's a rock. Hopped over the fence. He's hopping over the fence. And I looked and that rock had a head looking straight at us all of a sudden. It was actually a fallow deer with its bum turned to us and it had it curved over completely while it was eating. And essentially, it just looked, while we had the sun shining in our eyes, it just looked like a rock. And so as we got over the fence and and it saw us, it turned completely around. So I turned around and I've got this deer looking straight at me at 40 meters. So as a concept, it can happen very, very easily where if you do not actually glass over everything and do it often, you will get found out by animals and or you'll do a stalk on an animal that's not actually an animal. And that's a sucky thing to do. Um, So glass things as much as possible. Um. Get ridiculously familiar with your block. So if it's a block you're going to be going to consistently, um, figuring out like, okay, where are the hills? Where are the valleys? Where are the gullies? Where are the creeks? Where's the water sources? Um, where's the food that they like to eat? Where are the trails that they like to walk along as much as possible? Start to pat- and start to pattern not only your block, but also the animals. Like when I go to uh, my family block for red deer in particular, I now know like the five or six spaces where they'll almost always be. And so I'll go to one of these places and if they're not there, I'll go to the next space. And if they're not there, I'll go to the next space. And yes, it changes over time, but they're typically in one of these spots. And so as a concept, once you understand your block and know it like the back of your hand, that's when you can start to do that exact same thing and just go, okay, well, 
the deer probably aren't going to be out in this flat. They're probably going to be up in this little, um, this little bowl where they always love to hang out. There's plenty of food. There's water there. Let's just go straight there, right? As a concept. But the more you can understand, um, and that comes from glassing everything, from understanding the the ebbs and flows of the mountains within your within your blocks, knowing where um, the erosion has happened, where the creeks go deep versus where they're high, and where you, so yeah, um, like if you're on a creek bed. Is there parts of it that are completely drop offs complete compared to like um, a shallow part of the creek or something like that where they like to hang out the most? The other side of this is like when you're glassing, look under trees and look in shaded spots a lot because most of the animals, they don't like to be out in direct sunlight and they will bed up underneath a tree or underneath something where they feel safe. And so where, where they've got shade, where they can look out at you uh, or look out at things coming close to them and make sure that they're feeling safe from where go. Um, let your senses dial in as well. So when you're actually getting out into the wild and starting to hunt a lot more, start to, um, yes, looking with your eyes, um, but also start to tap into like the sounds that are happening around you. Can you hear footsteps? Can you hear sounds of animals? Is there a goat bleeding three gullies away that you can maybe just faintly hear? Uh, are you smelling animals and that's something that you'll get used to the more animals you start to come along or come across is like the smell of pigs the smell of deer the smell of goats and you'll you'll go through an area where they've been and you're like i can this there's, there's something here like i can smell it it's either just been here i'm getting like a little waft of it i've shot three deer now with my bow purely because i could smell it before i saw it and so i've come into an area i've walked in i'm gone there's deer here somewhere i'm just going to slow right down take it very steady and keep my eyes open as much as I can look all over the place, look underneath every tree, look in every bush and see what I can find. And sure enough, uh, it's always paid off for me having, having that smell. And now within saying that I say always paid off for me, there's been time where I've smelt them and been said, there's been a deer here, there's deer here somewhere and not being able to find them, but tapping into your senses and, and paying attention to your gut feeling of different areas is going to be really powerful and something that you will start to, develop the more hunting that you do um walk slowly and stick to the shadows as much as possible so if you think about it if you see something out in the open in open sunlight it's going to shine and you do that that exact same thing you'll probably look like a ghost when you're out there especially if you're in camouflage or whatever it's typically not like a matte material it's a, a some form of almost shiny material right so if you're out in the wild in the in the um straight sunlight you will sparkle essentially and it's not um what you want to have happening so stick to the shadows as much as possible me be mindful of your step and try to minimize your noise as much as possible um when you're walking something that james dooms has said to me that's always stuck with me is like plan out your footsteps so have a look down see what's coming up is there any big sticks or um small sticks or really crunchy leaves you have to be aware of um, and map out like, okay, for the next four or five steps, I'm going to take here, 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 roughly. Right. And then you go ahead and you take those next few steps and you don't have to look down when you're doing that because you've already mapped it out within your head. doesn't necessarily always work out, but as a process, that's a, a really easy thing to just minimize your, your noise. Um, one thing that a lot of beginners don't understand is just how heavily they will walk. And so often when I've gone out for, for hunts for, with people for their very first time, and they're literally like stomping the yard as they come on out. You're like, bro, let's just calm it down a little bit. Like really be focused and mindful of the things that you're doing as you're walking through. And if you think about it, a, a stick might fall from a branch or from a tree and hit the ground and break. That's something that would happen in the wild. So you stepping on a stick is not the end of the world. You like bashing through step after step. That is something that is going to be very foreign to an animal and make their spidey senses go off, their alarm bells go off and say, there's something not right about that sound. I'm going to be more aware than what I should be or than what I usually am right now. Um, and if you're on a game trail, if you're following a game trail, just make sure that you're mindful of like what's in front of you. Is there, is there places where an animal could step out of? Um, is there any animals coming along the game trail? Don't walk with your head down. Uh, if you're on the top of a ridge, try not to get yourself skylined. And what I mean by that is if I'm standing um, on the very top of a ridge and I've got, let's do it like right here. I've got a shadow, right? In, in the video, if you're watching me, if I'm right on top 
and something's looking up and the sun's just shining and the sun's shining on me, they're going to be like, mm, that's something and that's something that's moving out of here, right? Or they look up and they can just see this silhouette of a human. It's not going to be something that they necessarily stick around for, right? So yeah, be mindful of where you're walking. A lot of people say kind of sit on that um, top third of a ridge if you're walking around the ridge. Um, one thing is that a lot of animals will stick to the game trails just because it's the easiest path for them, right? It's the thing that they know. It's the places they've walked before. It doesn't mean they're always going to use them, but it is going to be like driving. Um, for us, we drive on a highway because it's the easiest route to get there versus going through all the back streets. Sometimes you do use the back streets, but not necessarily always the the way that you go because it's windy and it's hard compared to just going on a straight highway where you can hit your hundred k's and, and stay on that speed limit light. So um, yeah, really looking for like animals will take the easiest path as possible. And so how can you make sure that you're kind of in that, that position to, to set up for that? Um, if there's a space where lots of game trails kind of interject, that's something that you'd call a pinch. So it's like a big crossover point where lots of animals will often come to throughout the day. One of those spots is, is definitely worthwhile sitting off of if you're not necessarily out for, um, not up for going for a massive walk um, and walking to find your animals. They do say, do the miles get the smiles. But if that's not something that you're up for, then you find a pinch, then that is a really great place to position yourself and set up your own little blind. A blind being like um, a stack of, leaves or something to, you can kind of stack of leaves a stack of trees and bushes and stuff essentially to make you like hidden behind a wall of some sort a blind is typically like a, a mini hut that you can sit in right but when you're in the wild and you're trying to make your own blind you probably make it out of sticks and and a stack of some sort if you can um if not hide yourself in a, in a bush or something like that um in regards to what we're looking for when we're out and hunting, um, if it's a new block in particular, or just if we're trying to look for animals, you're looking for wet poo or scat. I mean, you're looking for poo in general just to see what animals are about. Um, so a, a wet or a fresh poo will be wet and more greeny in color most of the time um, versus as it dries, it gets darker and blacker. Um, and yeah, if it's got like that wet residue to it still, it's probably going to be more recent. If it's very soft, it's going to be more recent. Um, if it tastes good, no, don't do that. <laughs> um, in regards to your fence lines, um, tufts of hair. So if you're like, hmm, I think that's a game trail. And then there's all of these tufts of hair hanging off of the the um, the wires. Like if there's a a barbed wire, for instance, um, different animals will get their hair caught as they duck underneath the fence. Um, well-worn game trails. So sometimes you'll see a game trail and it just won't be walked on at all. It's like one that they've completely abandoned versus other ones that they've walked on consistently. And if it's rained recently, you'll see um, footprints through it. If it's really dusty, you'll see footprints through it. Um, muddy prints in general. So if you're going anywhere near the wet, like if it's a dam or a creek, um, you'll find crossings in the creek. You'll find places where they've walked up to drink the water and they've left their little um, little prints there and then as they walk away so uh, understanding the different styles of prints as well so you can say like that's a pig print that's a deer print that's a goat print etc um and then yeah of course if it's rained recently looking out for any muddy prints and fresh prints and you'll be able to tell the difference between a print that's been there for a few days versus something that's been like recently squished in and if you're not necessarily sure of how to do that just look over your prints and see what they look like as a fresh print um once you've located an animal, this is one of the parts that I think most bow hunters will um, do incorrectly. I can say it from lots of experience where I, I, when you get an animal in front of you, your adrenaline dumps and everything starts to happen. It's like this moment that you've been waiting for. And so you're like, have to make it happen. Let's go. And it's like, everything just makes you want to like move and move as fast as possible. And that's like the dumbest thing you can do you don't want to rush this process at all the animal especially if it's not aware of you being there um you just need to chill because it's chilled it's in its own little space and it's not used to things rushing around or um yeah crushing its way through the bush to get to it right and if it if that does happen it's going to run away so one of the biggest things is once you've found your animal and you've kind of made a once you've found an animal just take a deep breath like calm yourself down 
get back into your parasympathetic nervous system as much as possible, which is like your rest and digest state, right? So try to just breathe, take some deep breaths into your nose, exhale out through your mouth, do that a fair, fair few fair few times just while you're watching it. Um, they don't know you're there and your goal is to keep it that way. And then um, as long as the winds are right and you stay slow in your movements and out of direct sunlight, um, you'll be able to stay hidden as much as possible ideally now that even means like at times you're gonna have to get down on the ground you're gonna have to crawl you're gonna have to um slide on your belly you might have to yeah walk hunched over like essentially all we're trying to do is make sure that any movement that we do is not being spotted by the animal and one of the best ways to do this is by putting something between you and the animal if you can so let's say for instance you're in a in a, a wooded area where there's a fair few trees and stuff about and you've got some goats at 100 meters away what I'm trying to do when I'm stalking in on these animals, as long as the wind is in my face, I'm trying to put trees in between me and them or bushes in between me and them. And I'm using that as a block. So as I walk and still walking slowly and just controlled in my movements, I'm using to block their head. Sorry if you hear the mic, their head from me and my movement. So that if they sit and look up, that they're not going to see some person out in the middle of the open, like trying to sneak in on them. Okay. Um, that that's like one of the the yeah the easiest ways to go about it. stay in the shadows slow down keep taking breaths what's really interested is how um how i want to say the r word <laughs> how fumbly you get when there's an animal there you try to slow right down and then all of a sudden you like trip over your feet and you're like go to take a step and then you like fall backwards and stuff like the more consistent you can be with placing your foot completely down make sure you're completely balanced and then taking your next step and taking that as a slow process instead um the better off you're going to be if you're trying to like tiptoe through and like creep over things and stuff what often happens is you trip over yourself and you start to fumble and yeah it just becomes a bit of a mess so really just take a second build out a plan in your head before you start to go about it um slow down as much as possible and when you're stalking on the animal, this is probably something that took me so long to understand was like how to stalk properly. The biggest thing is you just want to be make you just want to make sure at times you have to move fast and at times you don't have to move fast. And this will only you'll only learn this through the process of hunting more. But within saying that, your number one focus is, is to stay um stay out of the way of the animal mean that they don't know that you're there if they can if they if you can be in their presence without them knowing you've won the game okay um so making that your your a game is the the best way to go about it planning your way out i would i often go through conversations in my head if i'm hunting by myself and i'll be like i could do this or i could do this or i could do this which way do you think is going to work best right if i'm in a in a pair or a partnership where i'm hunting with other people's the best thing is, is talking it out with these people. Hey, I was thinking that this, this, and this could work. What do you think? Oh, no, I was thinking that you should try to go around this way and use this and do that instead. And you're like, ah, oh, cool. What if I was to do like a combo and I go here and then I use that and then blah, right? It's just good to bounce those ideas off of, off of someone else and kind of go through um, the different things that could work really well for you. So as a concept, I think um, just have a plan A, have a plan B, have a plan C. Um, the biggest thing is, is that an animal will have their own agenda and they're going to keep to that. And you're going to have an agenda that you want it to keep to, and it's not necessarily going to work. So going in without an expectation, but still having a plan, um, is kind of the best way to kind of approach that. I would think, um, watching the, the body signs of an animal, um, all this talking by myself, it's Get my throat dry. All right. So, um, watching the body signs, animals, um, they'll, they will react. I mean, if you, if you've got a dog or you've seen, um, yeah, if you've got an animal of your, of your own, you'll see the different ways that it reacts. Like for instance, a dog, um, the hairs on the back will, will stand up. The heckles will stand up when it's like ready to bark and its tail will get like really stiff and rigid. Sometimes the ears will be like directional based on what they're trying to listen to. Um, if they're angry, they'll be like, yeah, stiff and rigid and like ready to like really tensed up versus when they're relaxed, they're just very, just chill the tails down. Their ears are floppy and um, they're just relaxed and all animals are like this. They'll, they'll give off um, signs based on how they're feeling and what they're doing. So 
when you're walking up, paying attention to things like the ears, the tail, seeing what the eyes are doing, seeing um, how the hairs on the back are and stuff like that, that, that stuff all pays, um, it plays to pay attention to. And so if the ears and tails, sorry, the ears and tails give away a lot in general. Um, and so if the ears are like rigid and pointing towards you or they're like, they're, they're really tense, it's a fair chance that you need to be standing still at that point in time. Sometimes, and this is why it pays to look at an animal for a while before you even stalk in on it. And pay attention to these things before you even go in. What's its tail doing while it's just sitting there and feeding? What's its ears doing while it's sitting there and feeding? What's its eyes doing while it's sitting there and feeding? And it's in a relaxed um, position. Okay, now as I start to walk in, is it still doing those same things or is it cha- has it changed the way that it's reacting? And if it's changed the way that it's reacting, it's a good chance that you need to just stop and just give it a second. Um, so looking at the ears, are they rigid? Are they pointing towards you? Does it look like they're trying to pay attention to you even though the animal's facing this way um, or facing, let's say this way, is it like, maneuvering its ear to be around and looking or pointed towards you so it can capture any sound that you might make um with the tail is it floppy and moving around or is it um dead still is it standing up like depending on the animal once again um so if it's wagging keep moving towards it if not then potentially it's a good chance to stay still if the ears are pointing towards you stay still uh, if they're floppy and moving around, then continue moving. If it's like a pig, for instance, is it like grunting and just in, enjoying its food? Is it like chomping away and just doing its thing? Or is it like pretending to eat and look like what what an animal often do? And I talked about this just before. Is it it will see movement or be sus that there's something uh, like its senses start to kick in. It's like there's something going on right here and I don't know what it is. I'm going to pretend like I'm just doing my normal thing and try pick it out. So sometimes like if a pig catches your movement, and you stay still, it'll be like, hmm, go back to eating. And it looks straight back up at you and it like tries to catch you by surprise. So as soon as they go back to eating, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're eating because they do try to catch you out to make sure that they're going to be safe, right? These, these animals, um, they do have predators and essentially you do have to be aware that, I mean, depending on which country you're in, um, not all countries have predators necessarily, but most animals have been hunted at some point in their ancestry and it gets passed down to be aware of um things that are not that they're not used to to be cautious of them to run away if something's not feeling right um if the eyes are looking at you don't move like that's the biggest thing they look for movement they can't necessarily see the whole shape of you but they can see when you're moving and so if it's windy and you're completely still and everything else around you like wobbling side to side that could give you away maybe i'm not saying that you should wobble around like a dickhead (laughs) um wacky inflatable arm man right um but yeah essentially just trying to match your 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 area um within saying that if it's windy um you might just naturally blow with the wind a little bit and that's enough don't yeah don't don't pay attention to that comment in general actually <laughs> let's just scrap that part um the biggest thing is is if you're moving and they're watching you they're going to be like that's something i'm out of here um as a process when you're close enough to the animal and you're getting ready to to um, draw and take your shot. Uh, one thing we want to go back to is like making sure that we're ranging the animal or ranging where we're going to be shooting to make sure that we know um, your distances because especially in the wild, and this is something that I do quite often as I play a game, which is guess the distance. And so it's like, hey, if you're hunting with someone, hey, see that tree? How far do you reckon it is? Oh, 25. Nah, it's definitely 38. Check it. Oh, yeah, it's... I don't know, 32. Okay, we're both off on either end. Um, but as a concept, the more you do that, especially over like dead ground and stuff like that, what you'll find is you'll start to get your eye in. But um, in these situations, in particular, when you're very first getting used to bow hunting, you'll have a distance that you feel really comfortable shooting inside of. And so keep to that as your as your ba- like your like your base level of, I really want to shoot an animal under 20 meters, which means anything over 20 meters, I'm not going to shoot. So it means that if I'm ranging an area that I know a pig is about to walk into, I'm going to range a tree here, a rock there, another tree over here, and understand what my circumference is that I can shoot within. And anything that's outside of that, I'm not going to take my shot, right? If the animal's in a position where it's nice and close and you're like, okay, I just need to range it and see where it's at. Okay, it's at 25 meters. I'm happy for that shot. It's something I feel comfortable um, taking. It's a shot that I can make with my eyes closed. Not actually, but yeah, a shot that I do all the time. The range at 25. Okay, set my sight if I have to. 
and draw back. I know that I'm shooting at 25 meters and go for your shot process. Um, the big thing is if it's at 25 meters and it takes a step further away from you or a step closer to you, if you've shot and practice enough, what you're going to understand is like, okay, it's not going to necessarily make a big difference based on my arrow setup. Maybe it is going to make a big difference. So I need to readjust and do this instead. Okay. So each situation is going to be very dependent on what's happening for you in that moment in time. One thing that you see uh, a lot of beginners do in general is that they're very fast with their movements. Oh, I've got to range it and they move their thing up really quickly. Everything needs to be slow, 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 as slow as possible. Okay. If you're close, like under 20 meters or under 30 meters, even with the animal and they see this happen, the moving of the hand to bring the, the range finder up to your eyes, it's going to draw their attention to you. Right. So thinking very slow, pulling it up to your eyes, getting into position, clicking, and then same thing on the way down. Pay, bring it back down nice and slowly and make sure you're not bringing attention to you. A lot of the time when I'm stalking on an animal and I'm under 30 meters or let's say under 40 meters, maybe even under 50, I've got the bow up in front of my face. So if I have to just get an arrow on and draw, actually the arrow is already on when I'm stalking and I'm that close, okay? Uh, unless I'm crawling on the ground and it's somewhere where I can't necessarily get an arrow on and have it um, safely stay on the, on the rest and stay on the bow. Um, or it's not going to prod me or anything like that, then it's definitely, it's on the arrow and it's ready to go. If not, um, yeah, if it's not safe, then I won't have it on. I was talking in, I've got the bow up here in front of my face. So if an animal comes into position, I can quickly clip on my release aid, I can move my arms out slowly, position my body and just go through the drawing process, draw all the way back and then take my shot, right? So you want to kind of set up as if you're imagining um, setting yourself up for the best success possible. Okay. If you have your bow down here and you have to draw it, pull it up here, take your big shot. There's so much big actions that are happening and things that are changing in that position, which don't naturally happen, right? You don't see a tree naturally like rip its branch up to, to do anything. So, um, you just really want to make your, your movements as minimal as possible in that position. Um, and so. Yeah, situation dependent as to when you'll range find, what you're going to range find, whether you're range finding the animal, if you're going to just range find some distances around you to figure out, okay, if it's once it's in past this certain area, I know that I'm good to take my shot. Um, and then it comes down to the shot placement. Um, so two parts of this. One video that I did, it was a podcast I did with uh, Liam Woods and it was episode 98. And this was a, a rut recap for him, but then also we went into the perfect shot placement um, and I did a separate video, like I've snipped just the video out and something that you should watch and watch on repeat probably two or three times. It's definitely something I took, um, a friend out for his very first hunt a few weeks ago and his homework was to shoot his bow every day and watch this video two to three times before he we went out and just familiarize himself with the anatomy of the different animals we're going to be hunting. Um, so yeah, watch that video. It's called shot placement for Australian bow hunters with Liam Woods. And I'm also going to have the link in the show notes and that will be, um, yeah, that's a highly valuable piece of content because it showcases exactly where you should be shooting in regards to right now, I am going to bring up a little picture. So if you're watching on the video, uh, on YouTube, it will be helpful for you. If you're listening, hopefully I can explain it enough. Um, so all I'm going to do is just share my screen here. So this is a great picture by Ryan Kirby. Uh, the anatomy and physiology of the whitetail buck. Okay, so all deer are going to be very similar in layout, just different sizes, um, etc. Right, so whitetail are not necessarily huge deer uh, compared to like the red deer or samba deer that we have here. Maybe something a bit more similar to like a fallow deer is my understanding. But this anatomy and this drawing is very similar to what an animal will kind of look like. Um, there might be some differences to it like for instance how high the scap sits i don't think that's anatomically quite correct maybe it is i would typically think that the scap would sit down a little bit lower but when you look at the the shoulder of an animal you typically would think that this is all bone but this is the actual bone structure so the thing i didn't do was get a, a picture of a deer let's do it really quickly um white so we're keeping to the same deer white tailed deer so kind of a similar angle here. Um, let's see if we can get a bigger version of that. Damn it. Not really. Um, so what we're seeing here, like that, all that muscle and everything that's sitting there 
when you're looking at that on the outside of a deer, you can't necessarily see like, okay, the bone comes this way and then that way. You can kind of see structures and stuff of, of the muscles when you know the anatomy, but it doesn't make you think like I should be shooting in here. Okay. So if we jump back to this process, uh, Canva here, if we jump back in here, your heart kind of sits And one concept that often gets said is, um, go to the bottom of the deer, a third of the way up and a center, the center of the front leg. Um, that's kind of like the perfect shot. So a third of the way up, center way through the front leg. That's your perfect heart shot on, on most critters. And if you're aiming for the heart on a deer and the deer ducks down, the thing is that the lungs sit above it and you're typically, even if it ducks, say it ducks, I don't know, a few inches, you're still going to hit the lungs and that's a great part about it. So as a concept, what they call here is the triangle, the magic triangle. And essentially what the magic triangle is, is the part that encapsulates all of the vitals in this position. So you've got your heart, your lungs, your liver all the way back here, and then your guts all the way back here. We do not want to be shooting liver or guts, ideally. We're aiming for either the heart or the lungs. And then as the, the body of the animal changes, the vitals do not change position. So what we're then thinking about is if an animal is on a different position, so let's have a look at this top-down view here. If you can think this is where the heart is in the middle, it's still sitting at a third of the way uh, from the bottom, okay? But it's in the center of the body here. Uh, and then you've got your lungs on either side. If we were taking a uh, quartering away shot, which is shooting from this angle back here, like the angle back and onto the deer, uh, so as if the, the bum was kind of the closest variation to you, not facing directly at you, but on angle. Um, let me see if I can maybe get a line here. Yeah. Elements. Line. Oh gosh, where did that go? Okay. So, um, how do I move you line there? So you'd be shooting through on that angle. So as if you're shooting behind and your arrow is going to be coming through. If you have a look at the difference, um, if you're shooting side on, you'd be aiming in this sort of position here. We're shooting from back here. We're now going to be entering in through one of the back ribs here and shooting back through. And depending on the angle that you're shooting from, I mean, really, you can still be hitting if you're shooting through there. So shooting really close to that um depending on your position, but shooting in actually through the guts, out through the heart, and then out and exiting out through that shoulder, right? Um, ideally, when you're very first starting, wait for your shot. Wait for the shot to be broadside, which is this position that this deer is standing in here where it's just side on view. You've got a perfect shot onto the shoulder where you're essentially going to be able to shoot into that heart and or lung position. Um, one thing when you look at, once again, that deer picture, let's see if we can find another one. Um, so here we have two different deer standing here this one is quartering away there's not necessarily like that shot if you were to enter in through there would be kind of the position we'd be looking for obviously low down in through here somewhere this deer is more of a broadside shot which is what we want to be aiming for. And this, as a, as a deer, if you're shooting a goat or like a really shaggy boar or something like that, shaggy pig, the hard thing is that you can't necessarily always make out these little muscles and lines and bits and pieces. Um, and so a deer is very, um, they anatomically, you can almost see what's going on versus if it's a goat, you can't necessarily see like the elbow joint or where the shoulder is. So just getting used to knowing the positions of the, of the bones and knowing how they sit we know that we're going to want to be sending that that um, arrow in through the boiler room. Uh, where did I put this one? Here. In through the boiler room being the heart and or um, the lungs as a position is going to be ideal. So once again, as a reference point, oh, what I was going to get to is the base of um, an animal standing with his legs slightly further forward or back um, can change the position of the shot. So for instance, this deer, Although it's somewhat spot on or side on, what's happened is because its front foot is the offside foot and its back foot is the one that's closest to it, meaning the back of the front foot as it's taking a step. What's happened is this bone, instead of it being here to here up to here, is now starting here 
Oh gosh, I clicked on it. Shouldn't have done that. Damn technologies. Um, what's happened there? Okay, so instead of it being, um, like I said, here and across down like that, it's now moved and it's up and blocking the whole vital area. So blocking your heart. So what we really want to see here is that this front foot comes further forward before we take that shot. And then when that foot comes further forward, then in regards to the shot placement, once again, we go midway, meaning the middle of the leg of the front leg and a third the way up the body. Another way that I've heard it said is like an inch up from the elbow joint. Um, no, I'm getting that wrong. Maybe it's two inches up, one inch in. So two inches up from the elbow joint, one inch in towards the shoulder and shooting in that position there. And you'll see an animal go down in front of you. But I would really go say go back because we used Go back and watch the video that I did with Liam because I did, um, we did literally like all different positions of all different animals and different shot placements that you could be taking based on the animal that you were shooting and stuff. And it was really, really valuable. I'd really say go and watch that video because the, um, the insights that that offers is just ridiculous. It really is. Um, so where am I? Wrong page. Um, let's come back and find my little document so I can keep talking to the things I want to talk to. Um, so range before you draw, make sure you get your shot placement, right? When you're drawing your bow on an animal, um, set your sight if you need to. So make sure it's in the distances. Um, if you've got a single pin sight in particular and you need to set it to your 25 meters or whatever it is, set it first. Don't sky draw, have your bow right in front of you, make it slow and smooth, slow is smooth, smooth is fast. Um, deep breaths as much as you can really take your time. Remember any big movements or big actions, the animal is going to become aware of you and an, an alert animal is something that can move really fast and will drop the shot. You'll drop your shot. It'll drop the string. It will move on your shot. Um, even a, an animal that's not that alert will sometimes even drop the string. And so it will react to the string. So making sure you're aiming for that bottom third every time, uh, is going to be really, 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 really powerful for you. Um, take your time and wait for the shot. Wait for the broadside shot. That's the animal will move around a lot. It'll sit down. It'll eat. Uh, sorry, it'll stick its head down. It'll eat. It'll hop back up. It'll come over here for a little bit. It'll come over there for a little bit. It'll step back towards you. You don't know what's going to happen, but typically it will give you another shot. You don't only ever have one variation. Um, and if it if it so happens that it wins you or whatever, then so be it. Right? It's just part of hunting. You're learning your processes as you go. You're never going to regret not taking a shot, but you will regret taking a shot that doesn't work out well. Um, it's a hard lesson to learn. It's something that you will it will give you uh, emotional turmoil for a long time. Um, let down if you need to. Let down if you can and you need to. So an animal doesn't give you a shot. You've been held back for ages. You're like, it's just not going to come right now, or I'm getting too tired slowly let down that's another thing to practice Let, letting down the, the arrow making sure you're not doing it too fast not boom, 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 knocking the arrow bouncing it around etc okay so um essentially all we're doing here is repeating the same process that we've practiced hundreds and hundreds of times as long as you're putting in the practice beforehand it's a repeatable process and we should be doing the exact same thing every single time um having a mantra or something like that really helps you just to make sure you're in control of the shot and um if you can go through your process, go through your mantra, your pull, 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 aim small, miss small, right? Whatever you're saying to yourself, um, that as a process is just something that's really worthwhile getting into. And in that situation, then it's not like a draw, oh shit, I'm so worried or I'm so stressed. I'm just going to bang, take my shot. And then it just, it, you don't even know what's happened. And all of a sudden, either the, the animal's got away or you've luckily got it. But essentially, if we've got a repeatable process, then we know that we can repeat it every time. Um, after the su successful shot, um, field dressing, one of the, the ways that I learned to field dress, there's two ways to really do it really, really well. One is to watch videos and the other variation is to get out and actually do it. If you've got a hunting buddy with you, then it's great, especially if they know what they're doing because then they can show you like, okay, make this cut first, do this, do that. Um, there's many different variations on how you're going to do it. What we really want to figure out is like, are you keeping the skin on? Uh, which parts of the meat are you going to keep? Are you skinning the animal and taking the meat back in just meat bags by itself? Um, there's a lot of different parts that you want to kind of question or are you gutting the animal and taking the whole body back? And it's all going to depend on your camp setup, uh, where you're hunting and what you've got access to as to how that looks for you. 
And so, um, yeah, field dressing will look potentially a little bit different each time. One of the biggest things to understand is like, if you're keeping, uh, if you're just quartering the animal out, essentially there's only one joint that you have to go through and it's, um, popping the, the back leg off of the joint and yes, it's attached to the hip bone as well. So you have to learn the curvatures of the hip and learn how to work your knife through that. But, um, when you're cutting the front arm, the front leg off, there's no, uh, ball and socket joint. It's just, uh, it's just literally your shoulder blades attached by muscle. So you can cut the front leg just completely off. Okay. Back straps, you can cut them completely off without having to cut any joints. It's only the back leg that you're going to have joints. So, um, uh, essentially what you want to think of in the situation is, okay, I'm taking meat from this animal. What is my process going to be? Am I field dressing on the spot? Am I keeping the guts in or taking the guts out? Uh, am I keeping hair on or taking the hair off? Am I caping the animal? Is it something that I want to keep? Um, and if I'm caping it, am I caping it for a mount or am I caping it just for a skin? And in which case you just want to be more mindful and slower with the process. Um, are you, are you taking the hocks off? Typically that's going to be the way that you want to do it. So you're not carrying extra weight on that spot. And then in, in that instance, are you taking the bone out or keeping it in? Um, and that's kind of some of the, the biggest things, I guess, to kind of think of in regards to when I get an animal down, if I'm trying to take as much meat as possible, my process, depending on where I am, let's say I'm not taking the animal back to, um, to the farm and I'm not going to have the ability to cut it, to hang it. I'll typically keep, um, skin on and do the rest of the skin process, skinning process when I get back to camp. Um, however, once again, it really depends on, on the situation, but uh, let's say that we're keeping skin on. So, uh, we'd cut front legs off. I would keep it on one side, obviously first. So cut the front leg off, cut the back strap off, cut a back leg off, and then do the exact same thing on the opposite side, cut the front leg off, cut the back strap off, cut the back leg off. Um, from there, I'll typically reach in and get the tenders, um, being like your your psoas muscle essentially uh which sits in like it's kind of like up against the spine wall but on the inside of the gut cavity so you can do that once you've removed your your um your back straps you can actually just reach in and do it from that little position there you'll have to maneuver around the guts if you're keeping the guts in which i typically do if i'm doing it this way and then depending on what i've got i've now carry like a little mini saw with me i'll then um take the the um what am I looking for? The neck as well. So chop the head off, chop the, um, I just had an email from a guest coming on next week. Um, chop the, chop at the base of the, the, where the neck kind of meets up to the spine, uh, meaning onto like where the back straps kind of end and take that whole segment as well, if I can. Um, if, oh, and then in that process, I'm then hocking, meaning taking like the, the ankle joint from there there down or the elbow joint down um not the elbow joint like the wrist joint essentially because you want to keep your shanks um but yeah taking that bottom part of the the they call them the hocks off and ditching them putting it all into a, a game bag loading up my pack and then walking it out that way if you've got the the niceties of being able to hang an animal um one thing you do want to do is get the guts out reasonably quick like within an hour of the death um i did do a whole meat safety podcast which was uh episode 43 with bevan black uh blacklock and so that episode was he's actually like that's his job he does meat safety here in australia so he has some really good concepts around ways that you need to manage your meat and make sure you're doing certain things with them um but the the biggest concepts is kind of like guts out within the hour or the meat cut off and into game bags within that first hour of having the animal down ideally if it's a colder day then not necessarily having to react as fast um weather dependent on if you're going to be hanging it or not if it's cool then yes hang it ideally um are you going to be keeping it in quarters to take it all the way home or are you going to be butchering it up in camp um meaning boning it all out and taking just the meat um and then are you going to be changing the bagging system before you put it into ice or whatever that you're going to have to do to take it home so it all kind of depends on what what system you have back at camp. If you've just got an esky with some ice in it, then you're going to have to transfer from your game bags into some form of plastic bag to make sure that you don't get any uh, water in with the with the meat. Um, the water is what activates bugs and can 
um, yeah, create the issues essentially. So either the meat getting too hot or uh, getting liquid on it is the two things that could kind of contaminate the meat. Um, and obviously any other contaminants that get onto it. So for instance, if you do uh, a quarter and away shot and you've shot, shot through the gut wall, uh, you've then opened up the gut on the internal, which means that you probably wouldn't want to reach in and get like your, your tenders out because you're going to have probably gut matter all through them. It's not, it's going to be tainted meat. Um, so yeah, just make sure you're not contaminating any of the meat. So as a process, if I'm keeping the legs, sorry, if I'm keeping it as quarters, what I'll typically do is just get big, big old garbage bags and like double, triple bag it up. So make sure that there's no liquid getting in nice, tight, um, knots and stuff on the end to make sure if I can, I'll do like the old circle knot instead, meaning like a circle around the hand, tie it off completely. So there's no way that any liquid can get into that bag and then dumping on top of the cold ice as, as soon as possible. If I'm Cut it into smaller cuts. I'll bone it out and take it home, just as the the different cuts, um, and then even take some some bones home as well for for dog uh, for the dog. Um, so butchering in general, if I know I'm butchering in camp, I'll take like a foldable table and some double zippy bags. Uh, I'd take the the large Hercules bags, the ones I get. You get like forty in a pack for maybe like seven or eight dollars from um, from Woolies, uh, and they just work really well. They're, they're a great size. They're, um, the double zip obviously helps with if you're putting them into a, an ice slushy or anything like that and make sure there's no water getting in. If I'm uh, butchering in camp, I'll also often take my boning knife and my steel to make sure I can keep that, that edge nice and um, sharp or as sharp as possible whilst I'm, whilst I'm, yeah, you're touching it up essentially each time when you're butchering. Um, the way I typically go about it when I'm butchering up is that I'll put my front legs the skirt and the rib meat all into mince. Um, so in regards to that, I'm just chopping it off the bone. I'm chopping it into smaller chunks and putting it all into a bag. I just make them, I just fill up those whole big, um, the large um, plastic Hercules bags I was just talking about. I'll fill them up just with as much as I can, right to be minced and that will be minced later. Uh, the back straps and the back legs, I'll cut into the different um, different cuts just to utilize them differently so back straps i'll typically just take them whole as i go like and do extra processing at home where i take the silver skin and everything like that off the back legs i'll break down uh so on the back leg you typically have like your rump your round your top side your eye of your silver side i think people will call it and then your silver side and then the eye of the round there's a lot of different names that these get called um i don't necessarily know the the right and wrong of them all the round and top side are definitely ones i've heard repeated and the silver side and I have a silver side and rump are all ones I've heard repeated. Doesn't necessarily mean that they're always called that. Um, I do have a video on my YouTube channel. It's like a 10 minute breakdown of a back leg. <clears throat> and that is definitely valuable as a process. Just understanding the biggest thing is like the, the muscle groups will show you where they are. If you just follow the sinew. So there'll be lines where the muscles join. You can just kind of cut through that. Once you cut through the outer layer of sinew, you should be able to pull, almost pull the muscles apart completely just with your hands, just by getting your fingers in between the, the muscle groups and pu pulling them apart. Sometimes you might need to give like a little nick of the knife just to like break down that sinew a little bit more. But as a process, if you just follow the guidance of the leg, it will show you the, the different cuts that you need to be making. And then it's just about learning, okay, what are what, are what cuts? <clears throat> and then figuring out from there, what extras do you need to chop off it, if any, to make it uh, a more presentable and edible on the days when you're going to then take it out a lot of time what i'll do is actually i don't know if this is right or wrong but freeze it just taking it completely straight off the bone uh freeze it once i get home sorry let me say this in a different way i'll typically age my meat when i get home for a week if i can remove it from that bag and put it into another bag but i won't process it anymore until i've um got it out for when i'm actually doing my 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 cooking so for instance i'll get a rump not a rump, a round out, and it will still have the different bits of sinew on each end of it. And then I might just trim it up really quickly before I do my roast or whatever I'm going to do with that cut. So as a process of, I kind of, it's like a multi-level process to get it ready and uh, to get it ready for being cooked and being eaten. Um, and I've got my different cuts that I prefer for different things. So for instance, if we go back, um, back straps, I'll typically always do just as like a, a whole back strap, meaning like I'll chop into bigger chunks. Uh, like into sorry smaller chunks 
but then do it just as like a roast, uh, like a medium rare roast. Um, the back legs, so my rump I'll often do as a roast, the round I'll often do as a roast. Yeah. And the top side I often like to just chop into small steaks, like almost like thumb th thickness steaks, but they're very small as a, as a top side, whatever it might be, depending on the size of the deer that you've shot. Um, and so do them as a steak with either, yeah, that's just the easiest way to say it. Um, I have the silver side and the little, I think I have the round or something. So it's like these tri-tip maybe might be the, the eye of the round. Maybe, probably not actually. <laughs> it looks like a little triangle, like tube cylinder that goes into a, a um, tube. Depending on the size of the deer, I'll either put that into my mince pile or just doing them as little roasts. They work really well. It's kind of like uh, the eye of the silver side is like a little mini um, backstrap. Um, and butchers, please don't hate me if I'm saying it's all wrong. I, I, like, I understand there's different names for it. This is just what I call them. Um, I think in my videos, even I've called it the exact same thing. So at least it's like, once again, a repeatable process. Um, but yeah, um, those two in particular can be yeah, done as a roast kind of together or like a medium rare, um, barbecue type deal. The silver sides, I often either, I mean, getting rid of all the sinew off of them the the silver skin and then actually just sometimes doing them as like a, a one minute style steak that works really well uh if you're ever going to do um like a crumbed steak or something then that works really well for that um i don't usually ever actually do them so <laughs> what i often use my silver side for is biltong to be honest so i'll kind of keep them until the winter when i don't have as much humidity here in, in queensland and then that's when i'll do my my biltong up um but yeah as a concept that is essentially like the a to z of getting your bow going out hunting and being able to process or starting to understand the concepts of what you're doing when you're out in the bush um it's not necessarily like the most in-depth detail or anything but the process or the thought of elimination for me was there's so many people in my inbox now probably now more than ever asking me about bow hunting and figuring out how they can get into bow hunting and asking me like tips, tricks, questions along the way. So I figured if I could kind of put this together as like a little piece, maybe it might be able to help a few people. Um, if anyone's been sitting on the, at the edge and they're not really sure on where to start, how to get into it, what they need to be doing, um, then this can hopefully be a great reference point. So something that you can share with your friends who are also interested in bow hunting um, and hopefully just be like a little bit of like a, okay, here's a starting point of the things that you want to think about. And I guess some of the processes that I've, it took me a long time to kind of learn these things. And now it's all just second nature. I don't really, you don't realize um, how far you actually come once you learn a new skill. And once you, you kind of make it just a, a, a habit that there was a, a big learning curve, <laughs> like understanding that I have been doing this for probably six years now, or maybe a little bit under. Um, and in regards to eating the meat and taking it, like we pretty much haven't bought meat for the last three years. So, um, I think at the end of this year, it will be three, it will be the three year mark. Um, and we're on track to do that. Like my freezer is full right now and I've got another hunt coming up in November, which will see me out to the rest of the year. Um, and so as a, as a concept, like it's something that I, I do live and breathe. Like I, I try to get out hunting monthly if I can every other month, if, if, um, if possible every three months whatever it needs to be but it's definitely something that i've brought into my life and make sure i get a lot of it because it is just a, a process that gives gives back so much to me um and hence why i like to do things like this do the podcast and, and give back to the community as well and hopefully bring more people into the sport uh into the lifestyle into the passion whatever you want to call it because really the more people we can get behind bow hunting um hopefully the longer it will be to stick around and one of the big reasons for me also making sure that I try to portray bow hunting in the best way possible is because unfortunately some people are not doing that. And hence why I talk about the responsibility of picking up a bow. You're also taking on a lifestyle that is important to many, many people. Um, and something that you, you do need to treat with respect and responsibility because the things that you then put out into the world about your bow hunting is also stuff that can then dictate what happens with bow hunting in general. Um, and so, yeah, hopefully this has been a great little piece of content for you um have a look at the show notes i'll put all the the other um episodes and recommendations that i had i'll put them into the show notes as well and 
yeah thanks for being here if you're if you're interested in bow hunting if you've got some friends who are interested in bow hunting make sure you share this around um hopefully this podcast can be at least like a, a great starting point for someone um and yeah hopefully help to fast track you even further maybe even get you super addicted so you start listening to all the other episodes and and get into um this ridiculous obsession that a lot of us have um i just lost my camera um, there we go. Got me back. Anyway, thanks for being here. Much appreciated. Talk soon.